So, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me here. So let's talk about air quality. We are losing five years of our lifetime expectation by fine dust. This is about three times more than we lose by alcohol. And for alcohol, we can decide how much we want to drink, at least till the third class. And, and different to you, uh, my dreams uh, get bigger by getting older, because otherwise we are just paving the way to hell with good intentions. Yeah. So, look, e, e, we, we all talk here just about whether it's better to get shot or be hung, you know, whatever, or is waterboarding better than Sharia, and cutting off your hands? Yeah, we discuss whether it's better to have uh, diapers out of cotton and or pampers. These are both stupid systems. So if you combine one stupid thing with another one, you only come to less bad. Yeah. We think it's environmental protection when we destroy a little less. Yeah. Oh yes, please reduce your water consumption. Uh, at Starbucks, you can see one, di uh, one napkin a day yeah, it reduces. Please protect the environment. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's funny, it's the same if I would say, please protect your child, beat your child only five times instead of ten times. Yeah? It's not protecting, it's only minimizing damage. And in this logic, yeah, if, for example, Poland has been protecting the environment so much better than France just by inefficiency. So if you're making the wrong things perfect, they're just perfectly wrong. So mm, we're we aiming to strange things like zero emission. You can only have zero emission and you don't exist. <laughs> Did you hear uh, are all these idiots talking about product life cycle? Did you ever see a life in a Coca-Cola can? Yeah. So we're projecting life in dead things, yeah. a life cycle, and from that we come to durability, because we want to live forever, our product should live forever, but a Coca-Cola can is not living, there's no life in it. This is not scientifically at all, it's just stupid. Zero emission, you can only have zero emission when you don't exist. Even if you'd shoot yourself right now, you would have emissions. So these are goals which don't make sense. A city wants to be climate neutral. <laughs> How is it? You can only be climate neutral when we are not existing. Yeah. Or did you ever see a climate neutral tree? Just one? Yeah. So with all our brain, we want to be more stupid than a tree. Did you ever see a low carbon tree? Low carbon tree? Yeah. <laughs> this is just perverse. Yeah. So. Um, Look, this tree is carbon positive. This tree is beneficial for the climate, not zero. We, we define a zero impact. And, and this country is growing corn at big quantities to make any type of biofuels. When you do this, you lose between 11 and, and, 20, and 29 tons, metric tons of, of soil per hectare, yeah, topsoil. This country lost half of the whole topsoil in the last 200 years. Yeah. You said, oh, that doesn't matter because we have three meters of topsoil, now we are down to one meters and 30, whatever. But this is like if you jump out of a skyscraper and you said, oh, it works for 20 floors already. Yeah. So this is, doesn't make sense. And you can see this in this eco-modernistic manifesto. <laughs> you said, oh, it always was good in the past. Yeah. For techno te technology will fix it. We don't have an energy problem, we have a carbon problem. It's a mismanagement of carbon, not energy, energy per se. This planet has 20,000 times more energy input than we ever need. We talk about entropy and we need to have forces. Yeah, the sun is a force from the outside. <laughs> and then, look, if you just take it, it look, I'm, I'm an engineer and this is unfair. And, and yeah, so because so I need to know thermodynamics in detail. So I'll give you a trivial interpretation of the Einstein formulation um, formula. So E is energy and M is material. So when you have a big E, 20,000, you can make a much better M out of it. Sure, the, the whole galactic entropy is increasing, but locally yeah, the system gets more and more organized by the abundance of energy. Yeah. So this country is five times bigger than it would be without the sun because the vegetation makes a much bigger space out of it. Every leaf makes it an extra space, basically, for that. So we talk about planetary boundaries and yeah, system boundaries. The only boundary is our own brain, our own thinking, our own intelligence. Because, look, we easily could make five planets out of this planet if we wanted to do so. When we work, 
look, you can do something. If you want to minimize your carbon footprint, yeah, you need to wear a bow tie because when you get a little strangled, you can reduce the room temperature by two degrees Celsius in winter. In summer, it means you need to wear, uh, you need to wear a skirt, then you can reduce the room temperature in the same way. Uh, or if you would cut, down, you cut your hair you know, to one centimeter, it would save 3,000 gallons of warm water. You, know, you can easily do so. If you want to minimize your carbon footprint, just take the elevator. We have such a perverse agriculture that we invest 10 calories of energy for one calorie of food. So if you take the elevator, it only takes two calories. So if you want to minimize your carbon footprint by five times, just take the elevator. So it's so easy you know, to save the planet. So we traditionally take things, we make things, we put them into landfills. We think it's environmental protection when we build landfills or incinerators. No, we are only trying to minimize damage locally. And all these eco-balances are a complete flaw. Yeah. And you talk about, oh, the, the life cycle of a steel building. <laughs> the steel is a problem because people always only calculate iron and carbon. But when you make a car, we use 40 different types of alloys with chromium, with nickel, with cobalt, with manganese, with antimony, with vanadium, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not in any of these life cycle assessments because these are just traces. When I was a child, a, a, a copper ore had 3.5% of copper. Now we are down to 0.2%, you know, we call it an ore. There's just one European copper mill which makes four times more waste than the whole municipal waste stream of Europe. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons for people dying in earthquakes, for example, uh, we, we saw this in Turkey in 99, it said the United States is exporting their used cars into other countries and they make building steel out of it. And because of more efficient use of copper, the copper in, uh, increases in the recycled steel and the, and the steel gets brittle and at 0.5% the steel breaks like an osteoporosis bone. You don't find it in any LCA, in any. Yeah. So, we first need to say what is the right thing instead of optimizing wrong things. The indoor air quality in a building is about three to eight times worse than outside urban air. 40% of the buildings in this country have mold. In Dutch, it's simmel. Yeah. So, mold, yeah. this makes asthma. Asthma is by far the most relevant children's disease in this country. So, how can we do this? Um, look, <laughs> Yeah, we do, we do, there are all these things, it's like Potemkin villages, yeah, we are certifying buildings with silver, gold and platinum. <laughs> How sick! Uh, platinum is one of the most toxic metals and this is the highest level. Yeah. So, what, what are you doing? This is just a little alibi. This is a platinum building, the fastest growing peaks I analyze in human milk and mother's milk are flame retardants from styrofoam. So look, if you want to abuse your child, then be, be transparent about it, because then you're at least honest. But to give styrofoam blocks to children, yeah, this is child abuse. Yeah. In the worst case, because these flame retardants destroy fertility dramatically. They make cancer. Yeah, and it's just a, such a nightmare, but it's not in any eco-balance because it's less than 1% in it. Yeah. You don't find it in there. So if you compare styrofoam with whatever type of thing, this is a nightmare. This is a building. This is five grams of, of flame retardant per kilogram. And it's off-gazing. It's taken up when you have now a building made out of styrofoam. It's a nightmare. You can do so. So what we do is we are romanticizing nature. And I'm, what I'm doing, I'm testing this stuff. I try to find out where do we have the contamination in it. The peaks of, of synthetic carpets are much lower than of natural carpets. But we say, oh, we need to use a natural material. <laughs> How sick. The sheep was never designed to be a carpet. So if you try to make a sheep into a carpet and red wine resistant, yeah, you need a lot of chemicals. You're never in touch with the, with the wool. You're in touch with Teflon. And then you actually inhale it. It's far more toxic. It's a natural material. So we want it more efficient. It's in Saigon, Ho, Chi, Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah, there are 300,000 consultants essential to make things more efficient. When I was a child, a cow was producing 5,000 liters of milk. I thought this is a lot. Yeah, today, yeah, we are up to 11,000 in the Netherlands. Yeah. Should I squeeze another 1,000 liters out of this poor cow? Should I use some genetic engineering yeah, to make another pair of legs for, for this uh, poor animal that it's more efficient? 
we need to, if you look at embodied energy, we need to look how we use these materials. So you see, if you take a Heineken beer, the worst thing is the coating. There's no green, which is green, because the green is the most toxic pigment. So it, in recycling of aluminum, it takes four times more energy with the wrong coating, because you, you, cannot, you need so much more energy to filter the emissions. So you need to look at the coatings. We need to look what we actually have in it. We need to define it positively. When you take a General Motors, vehicle, for example, it says these brake pads are free of asbestos, but the replacement is antimony sulfate, which is a much stronger carcinogen. Yeah, but so don't make things free of. You need to define what you have. Yeah. It, the worst thing is that we believe it's an ethical challenge, yeah, in, but, but it's not about ethics. It's just stupid uh, to make waste. Yeah, if you're an idiot, you're making waste. You don't need ethics for that. Because under stress, like uh, yeah, Al Gore, you forget about ethics. I was in Kyoto, he was diluting the Kyoto Treaty. He said, oh, we can't do this to our industry. So we generated this feeling by the environmental debate that we are uh, 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 damaging this environment, uh, that you have a pain for this planet. You know, uh, one uh, m uh, person meets another one and says, hey, um, yeah, uh, uh, one planet meets another one and said, you look terrible today. And he said, yes, I have Homo sapiens. And the other said, yeah, I had it before. Yeah, it will disappear. Yeah. This feeling, yeah, you see Al Gore talking about overpopulation, overshoot, and all these stupid things. Yeah, it, it makes people basically feel uh, sorry to be on this planet. And when you question the existence, I see this with my friends in Israel, when you say it's better you're not here, yeah, then people become greedy and angry. Yeah. Yeah, normally they were gen generous and friendly, but now you make them greedy. The environmental debate leads to, in overpopulation leads to making people far more uh, yeah, using far more uh, stuff because before you pick it, my lunch, I better grab it. So this is why we let them die on purpose in the Mediterranean because we think there are too many anyways. They're pain for the planet. Yeah, so, so in Israel, we say if you save one planet, uh, one, <laughs> one child, you save the planet. Yeah. Here it says the more you kill, the better. Yeah, if it, it's overpopulation, it's the worst thing. Yeah. So are we too many? If you look at the biomass of ants, you see, it's four times bigger than of humans, and because ants, these pigs never take ele elevators, yeah, they work much harder physically. They equal about 30 billion people in, in their calorie consumption. So we are not too many, we are just as stupid, and the worst of all of them are the architects, because they decide about the material flows. And just, so, instead of talking about zero waste, let's talk about nutrient management. Let's talk about the right energy sources, not about uh, embodied energy. It's just stupid because if you have the wrong carbon sources and celebrating diversity, traditionally we reduce, we avoid, we minimize, we make our customer our enemy. So it's not about efficiency, it's about effectiveness, what we need to talk about. Yeah? For example, when your, your girlfriend is really angry about you, 50 rows is completely inefficient, but very effective, I can tell you. Or take a lipstick. I don't, yeah, and it's the same for men and women, so it's not anyhow gender specific. Yeah, a, a lipstick completely inefficient but very effective. Yeah. So think about an efficient dinner tonight. It's a, it's a glass of water and a tablet uh, with some New York flavor. That's efficiency. Yeah. So why do you talk about, always about efficiency? It, it only makes the wrong things perfect. Look, it makes sense to, to reduce the use of oil and gas, but where is our positive impact? We always define as architects impact negatively. We try to minimize impact, yeah, which makes all people the enemies of this planet. So let's reinvent all the stuff. The stuff which you consume goes into biological cycles, like food, like detergents, like shoe soles, like brake pads. The worst thing are tires. Yeah. Yeah, now tires last twice as long, and people think that's good for the environment. But the 500 chemicals now get inhaled. You have them in your body. You pick them up before the rubber hits the road and stays there. Now you inhale it. So we need to distinguish between consumption and service. You don't consume a washing machine. You don't consume a TV set. You just use it. It's a service. So sustainability is over. It's just history. It was important to learn about it, but it's not for the future. No innovation can be sustainable. The washing machine was not sustainable for the ones who were washing the clothes in the river. The mobile phone was not sustainable for the stationary phone manufacturers. Innovation cannot be sustainable. And sustainability is just guilt management. If I ask you, how's your relationship with your wife? What do you say? Sustainable? Yeah. I'm sorry for you. So it's about, it's about quality, beauty, and innovation. That's it. So it's a triple top line, not a triple bottom line. 
It's making buildings like trees, cities like forests. You can see this in Europe, you can see this with Ford Motor Companies. Make buildings like a buffalo, so you need to plan it differently. The design is it, not the embodied energy calculation. It's only because people can measure carbon dioxide, they do embodied things. This is a big project in Europe, 200 million euros, buildings as material banks. Yeah, we can store the materials temporary in it, and it's interesting for passports. I would like to talk to you more. I came over just for this event. I have 15 minutes to talk about it. This is just silly. You know, why don't you just, yeah, this is just useless, because it's only superficial with, what, with, with that. We need to talk about service systems. It's nice to compare a stupid aluminum uh, uh, solar panel with a stupid uh, plastic panel. Yeah, how nice. Yeah. Now we need to look at the system itself. We need to make solar systems a service. 20 years of harvesting photons. Then we come to completely different calculations in the thing. But you see, people buy robots instead of buying the service of a robot in buying 100 million welding points. We see buildings, we can be differently. The Happy Healthy School, for example, shows how to do this in the Netherlands. We need to get nutrients back. How terrible we feel on this planet to be here is that you can see there's not one organic label which allows that my own nutrients can go back. It's only organic without me. People talk about energy, but phosphate is far more critical. The energy side we will fix with the, with the sun. But do you want to have teeth? Do you want to have bones? Do you want to store energy in your body? Then phosphorus is far more critical. We, 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 we put just in the United States 60,000 tons of uranium in our agricultural land in the last 20 years. There's far more ra radioactivity being spread in the environment than it's used in all nuclear power plants. Yeah? But it doesn't exist in any LCA. Yeah? So we need to get nutrients back. You see, the, the Netherlands will be the first country. You, you saw similar pictures. Yeah? In, if you grow these algae, sure, it's, it, it, you can use one hectare of facade equals 80 hectares of, of agricultural corn. Yeah? Uh, we need to enter the food chain at a completely different level with bacteria, with algae, with mushrooms, then we could easily feed 30 billion people on this planet. Yeah, but when you want to eat hamburgers every day, it doesn't work. I'm the only non-architect invited for Biennale in Venice. It's the Olympics of Architects, and I invite you to be there in one month and it demonstrate how it's about celebrating human footprint, not about minimizing damage. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about yeah, showing how future can look like it, between the passive houses, the sealed buildings, the one size fits all. We do the skyscraper looking the same in Stockholm and Rio de Janeiro, and really looking, making regional architecture differently. This is the headquarter in, in Hamburg, and I just want to demonstrate it from that perspective. It took 150 years between the Declaration of Human Rights in 1765 and uh, the rights for women to vote uh, in 1919 in Germany. Yeah, 150 years more than that. Yeah. So things take time, but we don't have the time, not only for my speech. So we, I'm working together in this country here with William McDonough. Yeah, we jointly published Cradle to Cradle, as you know, and now you see every idiot doing Cradle to Cradle, but it's more noodle to noodle or noodle to noodle. You have a massive quality problem because people don't get the message. They take the traditional stupid recycling and they talk about embodied energy calculation. That doesn't make sense. You need to design it from the beginning differently. But these architects don't have self-esteem yet, so they always apply for things. That's why they just don't really want to be real designers. They want to be just beautifiers. And for that, we are too many people on this planet. Thank you. So first thing I checked is, is this a styrofoam cup? And I'm glad it is not. Uh, given what I heard, I, I feel like I should not even exist because I should be dead with all the toxicity that is around me. So you're just looking at my ghost right now. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but fantastic uh, sort of last half an hour and uh, that I was able to join. I'm an engineer who's, um, looking at some of the building issues in New York, right? And I have to say that, yes, indeed, this much of what I'm going to say is kind of optimizing within the narrow space of what the reality is, right? And, uh, and I think it is a challenge of the engineering profession as a whole. And I think uh, the profession by itself will not come out of it. It will need like 
the whole ecosystem of everybody from thinkers, architects, designers, engineers, <laughs> construction, uh, to really come out of that. To give you a simple example, um, if you look at a car, okay, you put about 100 units of fuel in the car. Okay? About 20, 22 come out of the engine after the conversion. Then about 15 get to the wheel. And 14 of that goes to move the car and one part of that goes to move you. Right? So just even ignoring where the car came from and all the embodied energy of the car, uh, from the energy you put in to what actually went to move you, which is sort of the service you derived from it, so to speak, 1%. Now, if I go from an ordinary car to a, um, to a hybrid car, I'm, I'm changing that one to maybe 1.5, right? So it's uh, just, just to give you that uh, sort of big picture there, you know, and, and a lot of people are saying, are we stuck with the current paradigm of the car or should we really just rethink from ground up whether it's really, you know, should it be thought from bicycle up rather than a car down? Right? And because otherwise we are just moving steel, uh, average speed of a car in, New in Manhattan is 11 miles an hour, but it's designed for 70, 90, for to withstand impact at those speeds. So the steel actually is to just protect it from something that is a fairly rare event or should be a rare event. Right? So anyway, I think I just want to give a couple of minutes on that uh, because I think we are sometimes locked into a certain paradigm. So I caught a little bit of the last discussion was about air conditioning. <laughs> Um, when I came in, I want to talk a little bit about heating. Um, we, we sort of forget sometimes about heating. And New York City, 70% of the energy goes into buildings. That doesn't mean our buildings are inefficient, it sort of, or, or buildings consume way more. It's just that transportation is lower than other cities, so the contribution of buildings seem larger. And I think the one part that we forget, you know, so this red piece and this yellow piece is for heating, and that's, let's not worry about US, mid-Atlantic, but for New York. And between space heating, right, between space heating and domestic hot water, it's more than 70% of the end use is for that, which is huge, okay, for residential buildings. So I think we are, we have focused many times our discussion on electricity and air conditioning, right? But heating actually is the dominant use. Now, one of the things somebody, you know, about a few years ago, somebody asked me and we did, with a colleague of mine, we did a simple back of the envelope calculation using existing sort of technologies, existing materials, all that. What are the relative proportion of embodied energy versus operational energy, right? And if you, Take into account 50 years of it, embodied actually looks small. What was interesting was that, you know, keeping floor area fixed, a cube of about four to six story height, you know, just from a mathematical perspective, this is not using any of the amazingly innovative stuff you guys are talking about. This is how things are done today. And uh, so that was an interesting observation. By the way, so that's, that's 50 years worth of consumption, okay? So if I only consider 20 years, that would come down. And you know, if this is using conventional materials, if they're you know, recycled and so on, that would come down. But I just wanted to give you a relative idea and, and the reason this you know, came out somewhere like in the middle is 
taller buildings actually need more energy to move around the stuff uh, as opposed to a lower height building. On the other hand, a single floor or two floor building for the same occupant area would be have more surface area. So, so that's um, then around some metrics and I think one of the stuff we did around metrics was to really start to characterize, you know, where, the, not for the purpose of the building. So I think a lot of people, you know, these are just estimates of energy consumption by building uh, in New York City. So we developed an estimate for the close to one million buildings. It's an estimate, these are not measurements. And then for each building, how much goes where? Again, depends on the building. And these estimates were derived primarily by what was the end use, what was, uh, uh, how, how big it was, not nuanced by what year it was built and how many people live in it and how they use, et cetera. But the reason for developing this whole thing was to truly understand the system aspect that you can have buildings across from each other you know, that one might be actually throwing away a whole lot of energy that this building could use. So could it help just not designing building by itself, but by looking also a building by what is around you? Okay. Now, the other thing uh, that is impacting heating a lot, okay, is, so in air conditioning, this number, right, from one to five, tells you in air conditioning that if I use one unit of electricity, how many units of cooling can I get? And see, over years, it has become from two as much as five. Okay. Now, similar ideas can also be used for heating. Right now, much of our heating one unit of energy leads to one unit of heating. Right? And that unit is generally gas or oil. So I think uh, that's, that's a uh, question that I'm looking at. And the reason I'm looking at it is that, you know, some of the renewable sources in New York, if you look at the blue line through the year, that's actually our heating demand. This is our electricity demand, okay? The wind, which is the red line, actually has a huge, huge mismatch with this, but it's much better matched with the heating demand. So if I can make that one unit go to three units, and then that unit also is emission free, then that's a big plus, right? Whereas currently that unit is purely from fossil, and it's a one-to-one -one conversion. Uh, if that unit on top of that, sorry, I'll just go back. This number, how high one can make, depends on what environment one exchanges that heat with. Right? So if I in exchange that with air, air temperatures can be pretty low. That drives this number down. But if I am exchanging it with the ground, I can make that number higher. So that's one, and, and you know, the, so why I say nature and your surroundings become very important, you know, your geology, your temperature, your wind speeds around you become very important. Okay, finally, I, I have one minute maybe or two minutes. So I'm not gonna show so much slides on this, but I want to just talk about something we observed. You know, in commercial buildings, moving around stuff actually takes up a lot of energy. So if I have a tall building, you know, what's this complex systems, I'm gonna just, what I want to talk about here is that we, so here's what I observe when I actually measure real buildings. So, first of all, Unlike, let's say, a car or a jet engine that was made in a factory, a building is actually made by real people, real construction workers who are showing up, trying to follow the drawings. 
And you can easily have factors of two off from what you intended the design to be. Then on top of that, how it is used by the people who live there can also provide more variability. So designers are constantly over-specifying building systems. And I've tried to sort of find out why, and they just want to be not the one designer whose buildings underperform. So I'm just questioning if there's a way to think about architecture and design, where after the building is used for the first month or two, and the reason I say that is unless somebody uses it, you don't actually know how it is performing. Can we think about leaving that process more organic or iterative so that we can actually, in the same construction contract, change things? Because I see, I mean, it's like absurd, I see, you know, 30, 40 horsepower pumps running 24-7 when first of all, you know, they could be much smaller and then if you operate them better, this is just one. I've seen situations, we have made measurements where 80% of the energy was just wasted circulating stuff around the building. So I'm going to pretty much stop there and I think global impacts of all this are going to be huge because everybody's basically doing what we are doing. And I want to just thank the various uh, students and uh, staff in the lab. Thank you. We get the two presentations together. I think one of them would be, uh, don't you think that we could make far more service systems? Uh, if you make a heat pump uh, uh, as a service system, you could make it much cheaper and much mm -hmm. better. And uh, like we have now windows on the market where you just sell uh, 25 years of looking through insurance. It changed the whole imp uh, embodied energy balance completely when you just sell the service of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so Can I comment on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. What do you think? How, I, I how, actually how think, would you optimize the system? Yeah, so I actually think so. I've done a couple of pretty large projects. Large means not physically large, but large in my mind in <laughs> Uganda and Mali across, you know, eight communities each. And what was very interesting was there was no legacy infrastructure there. There were no legacy systems there and no rules that I had to follow of the bureaucracy, right? And for energy provision, we had extensive discussions with the community and we went to a completely service-based approach, 100%. Mm -hmm. But we, were, we had the flexibility right, to kind of work in a situation that was completely, you know, and the challenge I think is that here, it, you know, how to go from a system level change is a big issue. Anyway, I just wanted to say that I, I actually found that both from the engineering side and the customer or the user side, the service-based approach was watched up. Yeah, so why uh, I'm a little unhappy with how architects deal with the situation. I looked at the curriculum from architects here and, and they don't really learn about anything, how to deal with material management. Yeah, and I wonder why is it not when two thirds of the emissions and you know, half of all the waste problems are connected to architecture? Uh, why is it not a part of what you're learning? You know, why is it not really? You know, why is, is it just not existing? And, and now you're focusing a little bit on the energy side because you can measure carbon dioxide, but so what? Overall, it's irrelevant. Why don't you make buildings which are designed for human milk? Why don't you design buildings where indoor air quality is better than outside air? Then my young students would have a, a, a lot of to, to do positively. Yeah, instead of that, yeah, it always is ugly class architecture, one size fits all over the whole planet. And I think if you want to be a little more, have a little more discrimination, if you want to be a little more a designer, 
Yeah, why don't you teach this? Why it's not a part of it? I, I prepared myself by looking at the curriculum and I was completely shocked. I said, hey, my God, what are you doing here? This is, this is just, yeah, this is even not Adam and Eve. It's not the alphabet even. And it just doesn't exist. So what do we do? Yeah. And then when I sit now in the dark here without fresh air, I understand it somehow <laughs> because this is, it's like mushrooms here yeah, when you put them in the dark. And, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. A little bit. I mean, it sounds like a little bit, it's a, a little bit maybe it's a, a, a symptom of something that we did want to address with this symposium, which is a kind of disconnect between disciplines. Um, and, you know, um, so we can get into some of the specifics of the curriculum. That seems like a pretty long conversation for a short amount of time we have left. Um, but I think speaking the same language, talking about the values, talking about what... Um, the uh, you know the, the the kind of more important questions are what are the problems with the ways we're doing things now is exactly the point of a of a symposium like this so I mean that that's a, a very simple and, and uh, partial answer to the question but it, but it does sound like we're having a little bit of a, a kind of language and communication problem because if you think the role of architecture is only to manage resources, then I think we need to do a lot of setting of uh, expectations. Uh, no, 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 no. I say the role of architecture first is health and well-being. And that's it. And you, and, you, and, you, and you don't fulfill the basic need of humans with that. Yeah? And sure, you can repair it later. But if you're sealing buildings, instead of first saying what is healthy air quality, yeah, instead, you, when you're optimizing wrong things, yeah, you're just making a bigger nightmare and all this composites and all this styrofoam insulation. It's the worst of the worst. It's chemical harassment. Yeah? And you, you, why it's nice, you see all these things about sexual harassment here on campus, but you're teaching chemical harassment here. And so this is the same thing. Yeah? And, and so it's not a disconnect. It's just to say, what is the purpose of an architect? Yeah? And this is to generate healthy environment for humans and, the, and not about minimizing footprints by 10%, whatever. Yeah. So I but that, that sounds like a, the topic for a different symposium. What is the role of architects? Because I think that, um, you know, speaking of numbers, there might be 75% of people or more in this room that would disagree with you on that purpose of architects. But I do want to uh, turn it over to any other uh, questions from the audience. We're running a little bit behind time, yeah, sure. uh, but if we can have one or two questions. No, yeah, exactly. Time to disagree. Yeah, w with your statement, because 100 million people a year don't go in Gothic cathedrals to save energy, right? Architecture is about the human spirit. It's about building for the human spirit. The most famous buildings on earth are Gothic, probably, wouldn't you say? And they're all masterpieces. They're in the United States. They're in every country in the Europe. That's what architecture is about. Energy is critically important, never more important now than before. And the ancients knew it. Michelangelo preserved the Campidoglio, didn't tear down the tabularium, saved billions of units of carbon footprints in the atmosphere to save a building and make the Campidoglio. So I agree with you, but I think architecture is an art. And it's now become an art and an engineering discipline too. And that's very good. But I don't think we should lose sight that the two things are married. And I certainly hope they don't get a divorce. <laughs> this is a question for Michael. Uh, I, I can still recall the moment that I read the thesis that we should do more good and less bad uh, when Cradle to Cradle was first published. Since that time, you've done a lot of work with industry, uh, with a lot of existing entrenched infrastructure in the current past model. I'm just wondering, I, I'm sure that presented a lot of challenges. Uh, I'm wondering if you can briefly discuss your approach to, to working with a doing less bad model to, to uh, changing it uh, towards your thesis. Yeah, definitely, it's a, it's a paradigm shift, specifically in this country where uh, religion plays such a key role. Yeah. When it says uh, you are evil anyways, and maybe for you it's true, uh, and only God can redeem you, then you only can be less bad. Yeah? And the highest thing is to be zero. Yeah? That's just the logic behind it. 
So you cannot celebrate human beings on this planet because religion doesn't allow it you know, from that logic. And so therefore, the, the key question behind it is, is sure, a philosophical one. Do you think that evil has its own quality? Yeah, well, like you see it in this country, the empire of evil or whatever. Yeah, um, or is it just the absence of quality? A building which stinks is just a quality problem, not an ethical thing. Yeah? Because ethics disappears under stress, you know, always, yeah, for 95% of us. Yeah? So we have a massive architecture quality problem. And, and we could see this, we did, we did with Brad Pitt, this, the buildings in New, New Orleans, yeah? and for low-income people. Yeah? And it's amazing, from six, 76 uh, uh, young children who suffered from asthma before not one of them developed asthma in the new buildings. Yeah? So you really, it's about you, what you can do. Why don't we do a joint campaign against malt in this country? So we, it's, it's definitely, the question is, is it dark? No, it's the absence of light. Yeah. So it's the absence of quality, what we talk about. So let's add more quality to architecture, because it, this architecture doesn't work for 10 billion people. There's no doubt about it. So let's talk, have a quality discussion. That's it. Yeah. So not, not an ethical and moral discussion, because for you personally, it might be good. But who commits the worst crimes? The, the Catholic Church, because they know exactly what evil is, the Vatican Bank, whatever. Yeah. So they abuse it always to the opposite. And it's all around all the religions. It's the same thing. When you try to, to tell people they should behave ethical, it's only that they it generate double moral standard. Yeah. Fair play in this country has become just another dirty trick to keep you away from doing the same terrible things. And then later people come by and say, oh, don't take it personal. <laughs> no. And not just think about quality and define quality in a different sense. Holistic quality, like you said it here, yeah, it's really about uh, celebrating architects. And, but this means, this means that architects just want to have that role on being combining yeah, art and beauty and human spirit and human intention and design yeah, uh, with quality of materials and energy management. And that's a challenge. And I don't see it in the curriculum here. Yeah. This is just pretty provincial, amazingly. That's why I'm a little unhappy with the situation here, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I just have, I have, I have one more thing to say. Um, but it's, uh, it's actually just really that I think it's uh, a fitting plot twist that the uh, panel that in some sense should have been uh, most objective, uh, a panel about metrics, uh, becomes one of the most controversial ones. <laughs> um, but I did, I wanted to have uh, you know, one more uh, question, and this one is for uh, Professor Modi. Um, and here I, I think I'm just uh, really fascinated by the moment in your presentation when you did the quantitative analysis of buildings in New York City, and you found this opportunity where one building across the street from another building, um, you know, may have had something to to exchange, where there could be some kind of um, collaborative relation, mm -hmm. relationships, some kind of cooperation, some kind of reciprocity, and that seems to suggest a really fresh opportunity for architecture. Do you have any? Um, uh, kind of observations about um, what could happen there or examples of, of how that scenario might play out or who you hope will use this map to find opportunities uh, to do something? So people are exploiting such opportunities. In fact, the groups of buildings that people are thinking about, right? The Brooklyn has some really amazing example of a community thinking across multiple buildings, but not just energy. At that point, they're thinking about energy, water, transportation, and you know, unless they were exposed to the idea of what was all around them, yeah. they were thinking at an individual building level. So, yeah. But it is, there are people who are actually starting to think like that now. Does, do you need information to necessarily do it? Not really, you could have still done it yourself, but it just provokes that uh, thinking. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much to both of you.